неинвазивное устранение уязвимости логического управления доступом в веб-приложении. В прошлом году мы делали доклад по общей теории построения системы управления доступом на базе формальных ДП-моделей. В этом году сосредоточились на веб-приложении. Мы представляем Национальный исследовательский Томский госуниверситет, кафедра защиты информации и криптографии. Когда говорят о управлении доступом в веб-приложениях, вот, обычно упоминают вот, три таких вопроса. Это какие есть уровни презентационной бизнес-логики, функциональной или уровня данных, какие есть атаки, почему-то их обычно два уровня выделяют это вертикальные и горизонтальные для получения несанкционированных прав доступа там, администратора или какого-либо другого пользователя и различные антипаттерны. Вот эти вопросы очень хорошо описаны в работе Джима Манико управление доступом в приложениях. Если интересно, рекомендую очень ознакомиться. Как выглядит типовая архитектура веб-приложения с точки зрения управления доступом. Значит, для нас важно, что есть двухзвенная или двухуровневая архитектура. Это веб-сервер, с которым взаимодействуют пользователи, и учетная запись с УБД, с которой взаимодействует, от имени которой взаимодействует веб-сервер с базой данных, в которой хранятся различные данные. Такая архитектура в некоторых источниках называется account-based, и мы будем рассматривать управление доступом именно в такой архитектуре. Значит, а почему неинвазивное управление доступом и в чем вообще задача, почему важно эту задачу уметь решать? Неинвазивное слово взято из терминологии межсетевых экранов для веб-приложений. Ну и в данном контексте она означает то, что мы будем пытаться предотвратить использование уязвимости, никак не меняя исходный код веб-приложения и его бизнес-логи. То есть мы знаем, что у нас в теории безопасности есть вот такая очень замечательная диаграмма связи различных понятий, уязвимость, угроза, недостатки и так далее. То есть как мы, как мы будем бороться с этим? Мы не будем устранять недостаток в исходном коде, но мы будем устранять уязвимость. То есть в коде остается недостаток по-прежнему, но злоумышленник не может проэксплуатировать данный недостаток да, путем какой-либо атаки. As you possibly, as you probably all know, any access to a resource to an asset must first be checked and validated for access privileges. However, it can easily happen that such a validation is absent from the code, or in fact access rights system is faulty. So in essence, you realize it's important to do, but you can't do that. For example, the project is over, but the developers forgot to include all the necessary checks. And at the same time, it could be a highly critical system where you simply cannot patch the codes. Or alternatively, You might want to develop a better system for access rights management when the system is already running in production mode. Well, you might remember that initially mandate-based access rights management systems were used and then they were replaced with role-based systems. And over time, uh, there was a stream of publications that showed how you could actually build a role-based system on top of a mandate-based system. 
which essentially means that a non-invasive approach to vulnerability removement, uh, removal, I'm sorry, has been around for quite some time. And that way you can actually protect yourself uh, from data manipulation, CSRF attacks, and other baddies. So our idea is as follows. We are going to look at a range of these tools that will essentially be non-invasive all of them. My presentation will be structured in four parts. Uh, first of all, uh, have a look at the terminology, then we look at the server side, client side, and implementation issues. I'll start with a couple of terminology slides to make sure we speak the same language. So, authorization or access control shall be used interchangeably in this presentation. And that is uh, very simple. Um, authorization is process for system determines if a specific user has or doesn't have access to a particular resource. One of the ones the underlying principles here is a full intermediation, which means that we are trying to validate and uh, check the authorizations of every access instance, every user, to any part of uh, the resource. Now, if you look at how HackerOne and other platforms work, you realize that what usually happens is that the developers forget about some authorization techniques, and the hackers uh, simply brute force their way in. So there are four policies available, they're all shown on the slide. Uh, please know that uh, attributed, attribute based access control is the approach that is essentially seeing a lot of development over the last several years. And the underlying idea here is that you can actually describe pretty much everything like that. In most cases, you will see that role based access systems are used. In the DBMS, usually, you provide for mandate-based access control, which essentially means you control information flows on the system. In Russian computer security, mandate-based access control is slightly different than what you find in uh, other countries. In most cases, it covers LBAC or similar approaches, which essentially access control based on grids. And the essential idea here is to protect the user, I'm sorry, to protect the system from top to top down attack vectors. Well, the idea is very simple here. As subjects out or users that have uh, uh, little privileges or low access, or I should not be able to read anything that requires higher privileges in the system. Now, please know the first item here this is something we're going to discuss in much more detail later. Whatever access control system you're using or whatever policy you're using, all entities must be properly verified and identified. As long as you haven't done that, you can only labor illusions of access control. A lot of soft security levels is also important to have. The user can access uh, an entity if and only if he has the right privileges, but most importantly, and that's why I'm stressing it so much, it is a peculiarity of the Russian approach to information security. So the system, whenever such a user accesses it, uh, should not really experience any 
illegal top-down flows. Whenever we uh, talk about such an approach, uh, developers for some reason uh, instantly turn to Bella Lapadula model, and it's pretty difficult to explain their predilection, their predisposition to BLB. It was developed back in the 1970s for a particular system. It has been shown over these decades to be pretty weak and pretty buggy, but everybody still uses the Bella Lapadula model. Uh, for a number of times we claim that uh, there are much more modern and much more reliable uh, systems that uh, will so that would support at least a uh, much more secure installation, but to no avail. There is a huge uh, platform called Rubix that actually runs all imaginable security policies and it claims that uh, Bell Lapadal is essentially simple, static and generally overall great. And secondly, we see that they use fixed BLP. Well, in fact, a fixed BLP, if you search for it on the web, you'll only find two instances, two hits. In fact, a fixed BLP is a dumbed-down version of BLP. The one that was used in the very first publication of Bell and Lapadula. Well, back when they weren't even experimenting with the Maltics operating system. So the idea back then was that uh, a user could get read rights to all the resources that were within his mandate, so to speak. However, he was only able to write files that essentially correspond to his clearance level. For example, if you have confidential or secret files, sorry, if he has confidential access rights, it means that he can read confidential and everything below it. But interestingly, he can only override, he can only write data into the files of his particular level, in our case, confidential. Well, it's pretty easy to implement because uh, that way you don't need to perform any additional checks. However, that tends to constrain the functionality of all the processes on the system. And this is something I go in to say in this list of Rubik's rules. Now you will see that it's important to observe the rule of session level being equal to, I think, an operation level, right? I'm just quoting the Rubik's manual here. Well, interestingly, Oracle OLS has the same approach. That's exactly what you see here. This is the read access chain. Well, you'll see again here that the system checks whether the read operation you're trying to perform falls within the strict confines of your mandate. So all security BMSs are essentially fixed on Bell Lapadula model. It's important to remember that the formal model itself is very rarely described. Which means we don't really know which particular pillars a uh, particular system is based on. Interestingly, uh, DBMS uh, usually do not provide APIs that would enable us to implement our own rules. That would possibly enable us to upgrade uh, their access control systems. I'm mentioning it because in other systems you can actually get those APIs, but with DBMSs, forget it, it's not available. Well, developers can obviously develop their own APIs, but it's, it is not really provided uh, by the vendor, so to speak. Now, let's take a look at what is going to happen if 
you really, really want to implement your own access control policies on DBMS. And we have the following constraints. We can't change the infrastructure, we can't change the source code. We are not going to develop a new <coughs> service tables that will store additional data. So we are going to perform it in a non-invasive manner. Uh, here we are going to talk about uh, uh, database management systems that will have uh, some web service functionality as well. So we are going to consider two different cases here. One will be an SQL uh, database, let's say will be MySQL. And the other implementation, if you like, will be a NoSQL system with a REST API. It could be Elasticsearch, Solar, or whatever, maybe OData. In fact, there are two vectors that we can follow. We can either uh, do it, I'm sorry, on a level 7 device, be it a router or a load balancer, what have you, or uh, instead we can go the way of frameworks or firewalls. In DBMSs, there are a number of uh, known approaches for non-invasive implementation. The green SQL, for example, and axiomatics are uh, the well-known solutions, if you like. But let me explain what what is uh, the novelty that we bring here, because all the approaches you see on the screen they either are based on access controllers and firewall-based SQL injection protection. Now, our approach is to show how you can actually provide for mandate-based access control. And how you can actually make it visible to web applications. Well, what you see here is a kind of a classification of all the approaches you saw in the previous slides. Now, they are clustered or they are put into different buckets depending on which part of the system they are addressing. When we looked at the possible implementations, we toyed with several ideas, and they're all again shown here in the slide, and you have to agree that most of these vectors will tend to be quite difficult to mount. Now, if you don't have a huge team of developers who will know the source code very well and who will have an in-depth understanding of most of the devices, well, chances are you won't be successful. There is another major issue here. <coughs> In many cases, people don't really understand properly what mandate-based access control is, because usually it is only confined to a pretty vulgar, straightforward uh, check of uh, two tags, and this is it. Uh, two labels, I'm sorry. And please remember, as we said previously, all the entities on the system must be identified and verified. Which means that if you try to do access control at the level of DBMS, essentially means that the minimum unit of uh, uh, data addressing is where you can provide this access control. Now, uh, my SQL enables you to address columns, but not rows, let alone individual cells. Linter and uh, similar DBMSs enable you to address individual cells, which means that well, they give you more room for maneuver. All I meant to say was that your access control formidability, so to speak, or your access control power will mostly be limited by the structure of the DBMS. So our approach is that we're going to establish a proxy server uh, that where we will need some strict access control policy that will be run off the pro proxy server. And we'll also need to learn how to properly 
identifying authorized users. Usually at the level of uh, DBMS, requests and calls from different users are not distinguishable. So whichever access control policy you implement, be it uh, role-based, mandate-based, or hybrid, all the requests will come in a jumble. From the viewpoint of the DBMS, they will all look like they're coming from the same user. So it's very important for us to educate the proxy server how it can actually identify and distinguish users. Obviously, it will be done differently for SQL and no SQL databases. For no SQL databases and um, uh, searchable systems, uh, we can have a REST API. Well, the way it works is that we'll have a server, I'm sorry, we'll have a client for the server. And the systems like this will enable you to send your requests via JavaScript or different libs. So in your HTTP request, as you will see from this slide, uh, you'll get requests like this. For example, uh, this is what a read request can look like. Well, that way, you can use an application-level firewall that supports sessions. And then you just revamp the URLs. We are assuming that we have a WAF here device or, or a load balancer, which means the users have already gone through authentication process there. So it's pretty easy to add a user ID from the load balancer, for example, and the level of proxy server, so that we can at least distinguish between requests coming from different users. So for such a test infrastructure, a pretty simple test infrastructure, you have to agree. We have all user requests coming through the load balancer. And this is, this is indeed a very simple example. We are using a big IP device here, which uh, has uh, an ID IRL interface. This is uh, a TCL language extension. And it enables you to address all the objects that are avail available on this device. Well, that way you can run pretty much any logic you want. So you see what we're doing here, we're checking whether a session exists, and then we simply add the user ID to the HTTP request. And now we can easily run, we can easily perform or execute any security policy you have for running on the proxy server on that particular request. Well, we'll need a device that will do reverse proxy for us or for the access. Uh, which is going to provide us with all the uh, labels and attributes. It could be your corporate active directory or some internal data warehouse. Now, when you've learned all that, it's pretty easy to apply all your security rules and policies. Now, this is what it's going to look like for a pretty simple dumbed-down REST API. First, we check whether the user has been authenticated. After that, we get a user's ID, and based on his ID, we ascertain his clearance. After that, we parse the URL, and we check whether the user's clearance matches the level of the particular object he requests. For HTTP requests, this notion of uh, call or request is slightly different from what you'll find in a DBMS or OES. In fact, it's easier to do that when you're dealing with HTTP requests, as the code has shown. So what we're suggesting here is essentially a way to fix the fundamental issue with uh, the Bella Labadala model. 
By installing our own proxy server, we are able to simulate proper LBAC policy. Say, if we have a user who has secret level clearance or secret level access, this means that he is allowed to read all the files on the system. In fact, if he hasn't read anything, he is allowed to write any data of any level. However, after he has read something, he is sort of jailed within the confines of the secret level. He can no longer write files of any other clearance. When his session is over, the whole thing is refreshed. So again, he can write any files or read any files. Now, if we are using SQL systems such as uh, MySQL, it's very important for us from the very beginning to identify the users. But we are assuming here we are using any load balancers uh, because uh, SQL requests are created at the server level and then they are sent to the DBMS server, which means that you can't really get the attributes we had in the previous example. So the way it should work then is that we need to develop a module for the framework is going to intercept the request and append to the request some user ID. Well, for example, it can append either a session ID or a user ID as a comment in front of a, the SQL request itself. Well, that way, the security monitor on the reverse proxy will be able to understand who is requesting what sort of information. The so called uh, CRUD operations are pretty easy to perform like that because they do not really require any top to bottom flows of information. Well, usually flows like this will only be triggered when you have embedded queries like that. And again, you can use cursors, pointers, or triggers to get around it. And we're showing how it could actually be done with cursor flows or embedded requests. Now the easiest approach, as you see here, is uh, the one that helps us deal with simple and embedded queries. The analog idea is that since we have user IDs appended, I'm sorry, since it doesn't come as part of the request, we need to parse it first and then check for validity internally. It would be more complicated to analyze individual routines. This is something we haven't really analyzed yet. We understand that static analysis tools could actually be useful because uh, that way we would be able to learn who actually sent which procedures and kind of flows they triggered. We believe it could be done, but this is something we have not performed yet. One more case I want to tell you about. Now, in the SQL query, in the SQL request, we can also integrate requests for data. Uh, we know that an attacker, for example, try changing the ID here in order to get the data on other users. So, if we redesign this request by appending our own user ID in front of it, we cover this vulnerability completely. Well, this was it for the non-invasive access control for protecting DBMS level. Now let's look at the web server side of the picture.
In highly secure web applications, it's important to protect the workflows. Now I'm referencing a particular publication here that showed that workflow protection, although it's touted, is not really provided anywhere, not in valves, not in frameworks, which means that uh, most uh, web applications that are essentially based on workflows have this serious vulnerability. And OWASP top 10 is a pretty well known vulnerability when you have indirect link access. What are the known approaches to resolving or removing these uh, well known vulnerabilities? Well, first, you can use token based access. If a web application generates a file name, or a name of a picture, something through here. And displace all this data for you in HTML. We can actually uh, calculate the hash, and then by replacing the hash, we will be able to replace the attribute. And then the application firewall will check whether this token exists or doesn't. Well, in fact, what we're showing here is that that could be a way to reduce the attack surface considerably. And this is what uh, mod security and a number of other firewalls provide. Please know the same approach can actually be used in order to resolve some vulnerabilities in access control. For example, if a web server generates some IDs, I'm, I'm referring to resource IDs, and they are shown in HTML, well, you can use the same token to sign those IDs. So you can use any objects that can actually be uh, faked on the browser side, on the user side in the browser, I mean. Could be access methods or cookies or what have you. Well, it's important for us to design this string properly to make sure that it's, inject that it's not prone to injections. And then we can run the hash function using a secret key. There are two protocols that are available. We can use a session-wise or a session-less protocol. Well, essentially, we can run it in a way that makes sure that no data is physically stored in the firewall. With such an implementation, you can prevent CSRF as well as replay attacks, as well as a number, if not all, of the workflow attacks. And it also enables you to protect yourself against ID manipulation. It can actually be implemented on hybrid. Um, uh, WAFs uh, network WAFs as well as modular frameworks like Django. Well, the stuff we just described can be quite good for protecting HTML elements and form protection. For some reason, nobody has researched whether same would apply to cookies. And here we're uh, quoting Trustwave Spider Labs blog, and these are the guys that are supporting mod security now. Now that they've bought it, I mean, so they're promoting and developing it. So you see what they say here. They've implemented it works like a charm, although they are experiencing some cookie data issues. Well, I can assure you that our students have looked into that. 
And they've shown conclusively that a cookie protection protocol like this could easily be constructed. So for every controlled cookie, if all you want is to control the cookies, all you need to do is create a mirror cookie and you'll simply check that you know they stay the same. If you also want to control cookie scope, which will cover the domains where it can go, its trajectory, its life, well done, you will need to develop a more difficult construct. Uh, essentially, that would mean you need a third cookie that would contain all this data. And after that, you put these cookies with all their values, it doesn't say where, but you also add the hash uh, based on a session key for the device or user. And that way you can make sure that uh, on the client side, this data, including the cookies, cannot be compromised. So if we see there is discrepancy between the cookie store internally and the cookie that gets generated, you can, for example, cancel the session, delete all the data and so on. What used to be quite popular previously was that user roles would be assigned via cookies. For example, you could get a cookie saying that, okay, your access rights are those of a regular user. Now, if in the web browser you fake the cookie, you can easily become an admin. And then if you sign the cookie like that, the initial problem stays on in the code, but the vulnerability is gone. Well, the obvious price you pay for that is that you now have twice as many cookies. There is one more thing I want to discuss, which was uh, how we go into control in the workflow process. There is a particular string of operations you need to perform in order to say a book by a book in a, on Amazon or whatever. You first select the product, then you enter your payment data, and only after that you download the book. Well, if you find a way to download the book straight away, in most cases means you've successfully attacked the workflow. The notion of workflow has recently been very well formulated in identity-based cryptography. They provide a stellar definition for a cryptographic workflow. The only problem we have is that it's based on elliptic uh, cryptography, which means that if you want to perform it, you'll need to do it uh, on your browser relying on JavaScript. Browser-based cryptography is still a moot point. I mean, the jury is still out on whether it's good or not. But there are some simpler approaches that could be relied upon. Particularly if we're dealing with a simple linear workflow. Now you can use either a simple counter kind of protocol when every URL and every request move the counter one step ahead, which means that you will have an HMAC error if you try to attack the workflow and go several steps ahead. A similar approach would be to use a queue-based protocol. In this case, in your web application firewall, you'll generate a set of keys. For example, if your workflow consists of three operations, you will have three keys generated. 
and all these three keys will be used by the web application firewall in a particular predetermined order. For example, if a user submits a request that is consistent with the other key, the system will not be able to decipher it properly or develop a hash for it, which means that his actions will be thwarted and the session will be terminated. So in order to protect the workflows, in order to provide a HMAC uh, token protection, both approaches will be good. And you have to agree that the advantage here is that you don't store anything on WAF, a web application firewall. You don't need to install the session uh, control mechanism as you would do with web service, for example. Thank you very much. I'll hand it over to my partner who's going to tell you more about the implementation approach he took. Now, this is a prototype we use in order to demonstrate what we mean. So you see, we have authentication and mandate-based access control provided here. Conceptually, this prototype can be structured in two components. We have middleware here, frameworks and Django, and we also have a proxy side. For proxy purposes, we use a MySQL proxy utility, which is, uh, in most cases, used for load balancing. However, CNC has a built-in interpreter, tokenizer, Lua interpreter and parser, which is great for us because it enables us to identify some of the entities that can be mentioned in the request, such as a DBMS, for example. Not much, but that's exactly what we need. There are two mandate-based policies for access control. The MLS policy supports all DML operators. And the other policy C, as I've mentioned already. So when you analyze a particular request for illegal top to bottom or top down processes, you can also distinguish between embedded and simple queries. Well, you can also deal with multiple entity hierarchy. For example, if you have a label for the DBMS, it will also be studied for all queries to individual columns or rows. And using a table like this, you can easily reduce the volume of the information you need to configure and somewhat optimize all the analysis procedure. So when a when the first query comes or arrives at the SQL proxy, the config files will be retrieved and checked for a consistency of entities and labels. After that, a type of query is uh, identified and the query is sent to a particular interpreter which uh, generates a set of labels. And then these labels are transferred to the entity that essentially manages access control as such. Execution flow can be illustrated as follows. So the first thing to be involved is the parser. And then based on the data you get there, you can analyze the hierarchy and see whether um, the columns, for example, are maintained there. No, for example, if a user gets access to a table but doesn't have access to, say, a column, then we'll need to analyze the query again and search for a column-related data. 
identification mechanism is important because it enables us to sorry to link the users to a particular request or a query coming in well, please note that we do it via tagging so in the comments we append user IDs and since these IDs can only exist in the application well this tool runs inside the application or at the level of the application in our case it's Django according to the manual there are several ways to generate your own queries what they all have in common is that they all work with a backend most popular class would be the database wrapper which uses cursors from the database libraries so cursors are usually wrapped into cursor wrappers and we decided to use them for this particular experiment So you see that uh, we use the patching in the first query processing and after that we send all the indicators and then we tag the query. We'll illustrate here the way query are rewritten. As we've mentioned already there are a number of issues related to this process because uh, the same account essentially is used inside the BMS uh, because uh, DBMS is usually don't distinguish between users and after all uh, there are let's say MySQL and uh, similar DBMSs which uh, do not really have proper rollover security rules Now, if you have uh, any particular access control mistakes at the level of the application, you will experience, uh, or you will have vulnerabilities when some users can access other users' data. And the system we have described should protect you against this vulnerability, because uh, that way you will be able to add individual conditions in the following situations. So this is how these conditions can be generated and let's look at two individual situations here. The first one will be relatively simple. Now, let's assume we have a column in the protected table and in this column we have user ID. Well, it could be plain text or otherwise. And we need to make sure that we have some comparison routine built in. And that way we should be able to check whether a user has access rights to this particular column. Now, a more typical case is this one. We don't have uh, such a column in the protected table, but you can, in fact, uh, link the rows in the table you protect with an ID in some other table. We have a many-to-many -many sort of example shown here, and you see that we start with a select query, which uh, retrieves the multitude of IDs available. So the multitude of IDs that are available to the user. So this could be done both at the level of the proxy as well as the level of the application. And here we have performed it together with the ID at the application level. Well, we also need to check here whether the table itself is referenced in the query or not. 
The way to do that is to check its config data. After that, we need to find a location where we can include this condition. So it's essentially based on the structure of the query. So then we end this condition and we send them together to the DBMS for processing. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any questions, please. The mic is yours. <coughs> Well, you first talk about mandate-based approach, and then you talk about web applications, uh, which is uh, sort of confusing for me. Can you mention a particular uh, web application where such a mandate-based approach would actually make sense for top to bottom information flows? That would be my first question. Is the question clear, sir? Good. My second question, then. Uh, you know what? First answer this question, please. Do you want me just to name a system or what? Well, you might have, for example, a formal security requirements like that. Well, in fact, a man like based approach is pretty strong. But what we see here is that by default, the usual weak system is implemented. And as long as we can't identify the users properly, we can't really show proper protection. I'm sorry, my question was different. It's a pretty unusual requirement uh, for a DBMS that a user would be able to, say, write all levels of data. And the system that you demonstrate, does it take into account user hierarchy and the logical links between users? Oh, in fact, you can deploy any policy you like. All we are assuming is that you have some policy. Developing a policy, verifying a policy would also be interesting topics, something we are not covering here at all. All we are assuming is that you have some policy, and we illustrate our ideas using some very simple cases. No, but I'm asking about something very different. Why I'm confused here is that you seem to be bringing together two different concepts, the one of uh, top to bottom information flows and the ownership logic. Well, the ownership logic is... Uh, only supported through rewriting SQL queries, and uh, I'm not saying it's easy. Indeed, it's uh, very important to understand the links and to know how to properly configure. We've shown it's possible. Well, I'm wondering whether you can actually do that in real practice, in real life. Uh, guys, you need to ask the practitioners, okay? We did it as a piece of research. Now, if you want practice, I suggest you find a company that would want to do that. And I think that experiment would be run by the likes of Yahoo or Yandex. Unfortunately, we do not have their capabilities. Do you have other questions, guys? Have you tried implementing it practically, whatever you're saying here? Now, what's the applied value of your research, in other words? Well, at the network level, you can easily use it with Elasticsearch. A 
if you're wondering about possible business applications at the Django level, no, this has not been done. I still find it difficult to wrap my mind around it. So you say that there, are, there is this uh, user ID, and I'm sorry, user token, and then you attach some ID to it. How do you match this uh, one-off token with the owner token that is maintained in the database? For initial initializations, so to speak, primary initialization, IDs will matter. Well, if you have anonymous users, you can't have any access control. I'm sorry. Access control only starts working when you've gone through authentication. But take SQL injection. And look at how such attacks can be mounted against the search engines. You don't need authentication there, right? And you can still get the data from databases. Well, in this case, availability of data via SQL injection depends on how you structure access control inside DBMS. Because SQL injection simply grants you access to the DBMS, right? So if you have a proper security policy running on your DBMS, if it's properly configured, it could be mandate role-based. That way you will be able to significantly uh, limit the damage, so to speak. What about anonymous users? You no longer have an anonymous user. The web server sends a query to the DBMS using some particular account. It's no longer anonymous. From the viewpoint of the DBMS, nobody is anonymous. I don't think we're talking about the same thing, but let's wind it here, wind it up. Thank you very much. I suggest uh, if you have any other questions for the speakers, uh, please accost the speakers outside the room. I'm certain they will be happy to provide you with additional information.